preparations for Tuesday night. Tuesday night's going to be a great service. You don't want to miss it. Wonderful service. Amen. So make your plans to attend. Happy for all of our guests that are here tonight. We want to welcome you to the Rock Church. We appreciate the fact that you're here. You have your Bibles in the book of Daniel, chapter 2. We want to read a portion of Scripture. I want to preach to you for a little while tonight on the subject of the enduring kingdom. The enduring kingdom. Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 44 has this to say. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Everybody said amen. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Everybody said, it shall stand forever. Hallelujah. Repeat after me if you would. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. That's the kingdom I want to be a part of. I'm not interested in being part of this world's kingdoms. I got a better one. Amen. And I'm aiming for it. And I want to preach to you a little while tonight about the enduring kingdom. Let's worship the Lord again. Right now, let's magnify Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. We praise you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Shake hands with three people and greet them in Jesus' name. Be friendly and smile and love them. And you may be seated. Our hope tonight, our hope tonight is by the conclusion of this service, you that are not saved will understand why we are so hyper about being saved, and you that are saved uh, uh, will understand why we are so hyper in our commitment to the kingdom of God, and I think it's fitting that this is the night of Millennium 2000, and it fits together with what we're preaching here, that I feel that God gave me, well, in prayer very clearly and very definitely. In the text that I read to you from tonight in Daniel chapter 2, there is shown here um, five different kingdoms, and all of them are man-made kingdoms, and after them is also another kingdom, which is the Lord's kingdom. If you look in Daniel chapter 2 and you read the book of Daniel, you will find that Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 are speaking of the same thing from two different vantage points. In Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, you have a record of all of the kingdoms of the world that have ever been truly world empires and have ruled over the entire civilized world. The Bible gives us, this is one of the most remarkable passages of Scripture in the Bible, in that long before these kingdoms ever came to pass, the prophet Daniel, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, predicted world history. He predicted what would happen, what kingdoms would rise, what kingdoms would fall. He told us what was going to take place many hundreds of years before um, a lot of it took place, and some of it has still not taken place. But we are confident that it will because what he prophesied that has already taken place has been so explicit and has come true. There are even places in Scripture where the names of a king was uh, given uh, several hundred years before that king even came on the scene. Uh, This book is an amazing book in that it tells us not only about the past and not only about the present, but it tells us as well about the future. I'm glad I'm in the book tonight. I'm glad I'm in the Bible tonight. There is no other book. There is no other guide. There is nothing else that can place and locate you and I where we are to give us a context for what is going on and why it is going on like the Bible does. I hope tonight to be able to show you in clear and unmistakable and concrete terms 
exactly why we feel like we do about the work of God and about the things of God today. It is not just uh, uh, the puff of an emotion. It is not just the thrill of some exhilarating experience. It is an awareness anchored deep and inexorably in the Word of God as it moves forward and things take place that were predicted by God. You see these two contrasts to start with tonight. I would like to explain that in Daniel chapter 2, the, the heathen king of Babylon was Nebuchadnezzar. And this heathen king had a dream in the night. In his dream, he saw a, a, the image of a man. It was a great man, a strong man, a fierce and terrible man. And he did not know what this meant. This man that he saw had a head of gold, he had a chest of silver, he had thighs of brass, he had legs of iron, and then the toes that Daniel saw were both iron mixed with clay or mud. And that was the, that was the feet upon which this image stood. It was a man. The, um, the king awoke. He could not tell what the dream was. And so he called the, uh, the soothsayers of the land. He called his heathen priest to him and said, you've got to tell me what this dream meant. All of them came and all of them tried and all of them failed. None of them could tell what was meant until they said, there is a man that's a captive from Israel that is here whose name is Daniel. And Daniel is a man that can tell us what happened. Let me just digress here long enough to say that I very, very emphatically believe that Daniel's posture in the kingdom of Babylon represents for you and I a model of what our posture ought to be in the end time. There were other, there were other Jews that I have preached about from time to time that were also in captivity in this same general 200 year or so period. Their responses were different. There were those that were found in the book of Psalms who were captives just like Daniel was by the river Kibar. And when they said, you guys are captives, but we understand you're great musicians. Sing us some of the songs that you used to sing at Renaissance of Praise. And they said, we cannot sing a song like we sang at Renaissance of Praise because we are captives in a foreign land and we don't have our land and we have hung our harps on the willows and we cannot sing our song as being captives in a foreign land. The, the captivity, the environment they were in is what dictated and defined for them how they should act in the world in which they found themselves. Uh, and they did not have a song, and they were not participants in society, and they were isolationists that was off somewhere by themselves. On the other hand, you have those represented who were in captivity uh, in the book of Esther. These were those that they were not trying to isolate, but they were trying to amalgamate. They said, if we can just become part of uh, the people of the heathen and get away from this uh, fatalistic mark that we have upon us that we are the people of God, then we will be happy and we'll be glad. And they tried to merge into the world in which they lived. Does that sound familiar? Tried to show that they were not different. Tried to become one with the world until they tried so hard to be like the world until they succeeded. And uh, they, they tried to get away from the faded fact of being the people of God, but they could not escape it. They wanted to escape it, but they could not. And I just would digress B here to say that the church can never escape from what Brother Young preached this morning. There is going to be no escape if you're a child of God. There's no escape inwardly in your mind and spirit and soul. Once you get the Holy Ghost, you'll never be the same. Everybody that's got the Holy Ghost knows that. Can you say amen? You cannot escape from it. You can backslide. You can go to the world. You can do everything the world's got. But once you've had the Holy Ghost, there's a brand put on your soul, brother, that you can never escape from. If you've got the real Holy Ghost, and if you found out about the things of God, it's going to haunt you as long as you live. You're never going to get away from it. It's not because I said it, but it's true. That's why I said it. And when you've got the Holy Ghost, you've got something in you that's faded you forever. Are you glad for the Holy Ghost tonight? I have no intention. I have no desire to get away from it. I thank God for it. I'm happy being what I am. I don't want to go back to the world. I thank God for deliverance. Oh, let's clap our hands and praise Him. Amen. And so you've got those that tried to isolate. Everybody said isolate. 
and you got those that tried to amalgamate. Everybody said amalgamate. But neither one of them worked. You gotta find, you gotta find the Daniel road. This is a man who did not compromise the essentials that God had given to him. He would change in non-essentials, but he would never change in essentials. And, um, he made up his mind that his course was that in his society he would do what he could to help society to find the true God. He would be the kind of judge that that ought to be. Instead of griping at the judges, he said, I'll be the kind of judge, I'll model what a judge ought to be. Instead of griping at the depravity, he said, I will be one that models uh, a life that is not filled with depravity. Instead of being one that was griping and complaining about everything all the time and talking about how bad it is uh, and getting the bunker complex and wanting to run off and hide like we preached about on things of the Spirit, uh, instead of doing all of that, he said, no, I'm going to come out front and center. I'm going to be right in the middle of it. Babylon's the greatest worldly empire there ever was. And it ended up that a man of God was running the whole show when everybody thought there's no hope. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's the strongest heathen power there's ever been. They're making people bow down to idols everywhere. And this man says, Oh, no, I'm not doing that. And God finds a way to elevate him until he's the one that everybody looks to and his God dominates. I don't know how God's going to do it, but that's the kind of church we want to be turning in the millennium 2000, a church that God can use to stand front and center. My God. And so he sees this image. Now, you've got to understand this image. Is a picture of what the world's empires look like in a vision to a heathen king. To him it looks like a mighty man. To him it looks like a great and strong man. To him it is represented by precious metals, gold and silver and brass and iron. To him it's represented as something that's tall, majestic, terrible, uh, awesome, something that makes the mind be staggered at seeing it in all of its form and fitness. Uh, God lets him see the world empires the way a heathen sees the world empires. And he says, that head of gold is Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, that's you. That's the first one. And uh, the second one is Medo-Persia. You've heard the story of the handwriting on the wall when Belshazzar was partying. Well, that's the history of the fall of of, um, Babylon to Medo-Persia. And it fell on that occasion. Medo-Persia then eventually fell to Greece, which was the third one, the thighs that were of brass. And Alexander the Great, with his lightning-like attacks, took the world empire, the world civilization, away from Medo-Persia and then had it for several hundred years. And then it was lost from Greece and Alexander the Great. And eventually it was Rome. Uh, About 300 years before Christ came, Rome began its ascension until Rome became the ruling empire. Rome, the Roman Empire, is the last empire to rule the entire civilized world. I know the United States is a great nation. I know that for a time Russia was a mighty power. I know that when you look through history, you can find almost every European nation at one time or another was the dominant power due to naval superiority. You can look and find a time when it was Spain. You can look and find a time when it was Portugal. You can look and find a time when it was France. You can look and find a time when it was Germany. And you can find a long time when it was England. But none of those ever had complete world dominion over all that was considered the civilized world. The last one that did that was Rome. And Daniel saw these great empires. And after he saw the legs uh, made of iron, right leg and left leg, and if you look at history, you know already that Rome was split into two empires, the Eastern and the Western Roman Empire, and represented by the two legs, uh, until you get to the toes, the toes uh, of that kingdom, uh, uh, of the world, of man's uh, civilization, is the last kingdom. And the Bible says that Daniel saw, that the Nebuchadnezzar saw, and Daniel interpreted that a, that a stone was cut out of a mountain. Uh, amen. God's the mountain and Christ is the stone. Uh, it doesn't mean that He's different from the mountain. Uh, it means He's the same thing as the mountain. But the mountain was still the mountain while also He was the stone. Can you say amen? And so He sees the one, a stone cut out of a mountain. Man, I like the Bible. Hallelujah. And He said, I saw this stone, this little stone as it came, and it crushed the feet of the toes uh, uh, of the iron and the clay. Uh, And it said when it crushed the feet of iron and clay, the toes, the ten toes of iron and clay, when it crushed them, it said, I saw the little 
stone become great. And it filled all of the earth. And when it filled all of the earth, it became a great mountain. And it filled the whole earth. And when that took place, that became that which told that the empire of the Lord had come. The final kingdom. There's the Babylon kingdom. There's the Medo-Persian kingdom. There's the Grecian kingdom. There's the Roman kingdoms. There's the ten-toed kingdom that's yet to come. And then finally, there is the kingdom of our Christ and our God, of which the Bible says, And in those days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, my Lord and my God, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms that I just told you about. And it shall stand forever. I want you to know tonight, I'm not preaching something just to feel good. I'm telling you, I believe every word of it. What the Bible has said has already happened to this point, and it's going to continue to happen. If you want to get in something that's going to last, you can't get in Wall Street You can't get in fame. You can't get in recognition. You've got to get in the kingdom that is cut out of the mountain, that breaks the toes, that lasts forever. The kingdom that will stand and consume all other kingdoms. My God, that's what the church is all about. Oh, let's thank God for the kingdom of our God. Hallelujah. Amen. Everybody said, I'm glad I'm in the kingdom. Hey, that's what I'm doing in this thing. If I was in Washington, D.C. tonight and by some quirk of faith was some kind of senator or representative, I wouldn't have any answers. I wouldn't know what to do. And they don't either. They're just doing the best they know how. And they know some of them at times go to bed at night. They do. I'm not just saying this. Uh, And they recognize how fragile the thread is that holds human civilization together in the first place. Uh, And they realize how things could unravel. And there's fear in their hearts that they would never express to you because they don't want there to be paranoia and panic that sets out in the in the civilization, in the in the social uh, fabric of the nation. Uh, But in the middle of all of that, I want to tell I'm in a kingdom that isn't holding by a thread. I'm in a kingdom that isn't barely holding together. I'm in a kingdom that nothing's going to move. Brother, I don't intend to give up this kingdom for anything in this world. I'm glad I'm saved. Ain't nothing, there isn't anything I've given up that I'm missing. I'm glad I'm in the kingdom. I'll take the kingdom over all of those things. That's how man saw it. That's how the heathen king saw it as a great and powerful and mighty man. Man. The image that they set up in Daniel's day, that they were all supposed to fall down and worship while they played musical image. When the music stops, when they drop the hanky, all fall down. Did I mix a couple games there? I don't know. I I don't remember all those games. I never was good at those games. Uh... And Daniel wasn't either, so I feel good about it. And uh, it was a man, this image. I would presume that the man that they worshipped was the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. I would also presume that it's a worship of man, as well as man's kingdom. Worship of man is nothing new. I was down working out the other day, and I know you can tell it by looking. And I was lifting a few weights. Laying on my back, pressing 250 pounds, 30 times, three, three sets of that. It was a bad day. I wasn't doing the heavy ones that day. Well, I can't remember all the figures just right, but. And I looked over, and there was a guy there with one of these string T-shirts on. And I couldn't believe it. I looked at him. He was, there's mirrors everywhere. And he was, look, uh, now I don't look at the mirrors. I hate those things. Because I'm humble. At least physically I am. And I couldn't believe it. About every three seconds the guy's going. I thought if somebody took pictures of him and showed him what he's doing. He'd be embarrassed. Man loves self-worship. Self-worship. Some of us don't have to worry about that too much. But anyway, man worships himself. This is what was happening there. Man looks at the kingdoms of the world. You read history books, and they want to glorify everybody's pluralistic ways. 
the cultural differences. We're going to we're going to celebrate our cultural differences because man is worthy to be appreciated. That's the view you get in Daniel chapter two. In Daniel chapter seven, you have the vision that God gave to Daniel the prophet, which gives you God's view of those same world kingdoms. And when you get to Daniel chapter seven, they are like ravenous beasts. And they are four of these beasts. You have your Bible, you can look. I mean, I don't that don't matter because we're just we got a lot of time tonight. The Holy Ghost fixed it where we don't have to hurry. So we preach three or four hours, it won't make any difference. Hallelujah. He gives Daniel saw these kingdoms. Notice, no heathen view of what the world empires is like this time. No view through the eyes of Nebuchadnezzar. No views of the kingdoms of the world being some powerful man-like figure. But rather he sees them as beasts. The first he sees like a lion with eagle wings. That's the same thing as the head of gold seen in Daniel chapter 2. The second one is beheld another beast, a second like to a bear. That's the same thing as Medo-Persia. In fact, that was the symbol of the Medo-Persian empire, the bear was. They have actually found these symbols in archaeology. The third one was like a leopard, which had upon its back four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. And Alexander the Great, after his death, uh, his empire had four, it was split into four parts. You can read about all that, and that's all prophetic, uh, prophetic historically true, uh, just like it was prophetically given here. It happened just like this. When this was written, it hadn't happened, but now it's happened. And then in verse 7, after this, I saw the night visions, behold, a fourth beast. This was like the Roman Empire, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was, notice it had great iron teeth. It connects with, with the iron of the image that was seen in Daniel chapter 2. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the other beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Remember the ten toes. The ten horns and the ten toes correlate here. And then out of the ten toes there comes a little horn, before whom were, there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. What you see here is, let me just take a minute, in Daniel's image, Nebuchadnezzar's image, with the ten-toed kingdom. Uh, that is the kingdom that parallels here the ten horns found on this last beast. Both of those. The, the, the toes are of iron and clay, which means it's got the Romish influence of the legs, as well as a clay, which means it doesn't stick together very good. If you're thinking of this in government forms of government, the first one was the strongest form of government in which the king had ultimate and complete power. Medo-Persia was much like it, but not as strong as Nebuchadnezzar. The third one, which was Greece, was less like it. Greece is the first place that we begin to see where people had power. The, the, the strength of the government is less than it was before. It's not judging whether that's good or bad. It's just saying that's how it was. And then the, the fourth was, um, uh, was of iron. Iron having less uh, value, less purity, less... Um, uh, not strength, but less value than the other precious metals. It is less precious than the other metals. Uh, and uh, when you look at the Roman Empire, it's the place uh, that, as well as late Greece, where we get the idea of a senate, where we get the idea of somebody besides the king having any authority and having any power. By the time the Roman Empire was finished, the Caesar couldn't do anything that he wanted to do because the senate would throw him out. Sometimes they attacked him and killed him. It was a, it was a, a deal. And, uh, and then finally we see that the governments come down to what we would call a democracy today. It'll get so much so that the power of government represented by the iron combined with the clay of, of the common masses of people will be such that it won't stick together. You can't mix iron and clay together. You can only make them stick the best you can. And uh, this is the kind of kingdom the Antichrist will have. It'll be a terrible time upon the earth, but his government will not be one that is strong. It'll be held together by, by uh, his political and his charismatic, his, his, his giftedness, the, uh, his persona will hold it together. His presence will hold it together, but it won't last very long because it can't. Well, it's also represented here by the ten horns. Uh, when you look in Daniel 7, this 
beast with iron teeth, which represents the Roman government and empire. Uh, when, when, that, when that government reaches its end, it has ten horns. Those ten horns are ten kings. I'm not getting into all that tonight, but those ten kings represent the ten last day kings. Uh, and people have a lot of ideas about who those are. And uh, there's, there's a lot of speculation uh, of how that's going to come about. Uh, but what I want you to notice is out of those ten kings... Uh, is going to come this little horn, which is what we call the Antichrist. Uh, this little horn will come up. He will conquer three of those. Eventually, he will ascend to power over those ten horns. Uh, he will have authority in the last day. He will arise out of the beast. Uh, he will arise out of the horns. Uh, he will come out of the Roman Empire. There's other things about him that also we will see. To speculate who he is tonight would be a mistake. Uh, because we don't know who he is. Uh, uh, in World War II, they thought it was Mussolini. Before that, they thought it was Hitler. Since that, I've got a friend who said that red spot on, on uh, Gorbachev's head meant that he was the Antichrist. And I said to myself, you're a nut. And on and on, all the stuff goes to try to identify who the Antichrist is. I don't give a rip who the Antichrist is. I have a concern to know who he is that is the Christ. Amen. Amen. I want to tell you, the Antichrist can't even do his thing as long as we're here. We're here and we're the ones that hold back the power. He that hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And the church is that new man that's here. I'm not worried about the Antichrist. I have no intention of being under his power. And I certainly have no intention of going through the tribulation. I'm here until I leave, until the church leaves. He can't come and do his thing anyway. Thank God for the power of the church. Amen. This world's going to rot, but it can't rot as long as the salt's in it. When the Antichrist comes, it's going to turn rotten. But as long as the salt's here, there's enough preservative that it doesn't stink bad enough for the Antichrist to get to come on the scene. The world may not love the church, but the world better understand that it's the church that holds the whole thing together. Because it's the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We are not children of darkness. We're children of the light. We are not children of the night. We're children of the day. When the kingdom of, of the Antichrist comes, it's called the kingdom of darkness. Uh, he can't do his thing as long as the children of the day are here. While we're here, we need to work before night cometh when no man can work. We need to understand the urgency uh, of the time in which we're in and the opportunity that we have. Oh, brother, I'm not interested in going back and living when the apostles lived. I'm not interested in living back there when Peter and Paul lived. I believe they're saying, my God, I wish I could be there when Wilson and those other boys are living. I wish I could be there at the end of time. I hope they stand up with boldness and authority like we did at the first and proclaim the good gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on, let's praise God that we're part of the kingdom of God. Everybody said, thank you, Jesus. Now, I want you to look in chapter 7. It says almost the exact same thing that it said in chapter 2. Talking about the church and the Lord. Verse 14, it says, there was given him. That's, that's the Lord and the church. There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. That's talking about Jesus which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Look at verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom, yippee yay 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 and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Look at verse number 20-something, 20 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom, my God, under the whole heavens shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Brother, I don't intend to be intimidated by the devil. I'm telling you, devil, there's a kingdom coming that's a devil crusher. That's a toe smasher. That's a horn blower. And when he comes, brother, he's going to take over. And I'm with him. And it's going to smash that kingdom. And the kingdom I'm a part of is going to reign forever. Ah, some of you that aren't saved, you, you don't like us preaching. Brother, you better get with it. Amen. Because your kingdom's coming down. Ooh, hallelujah. My God. Second Peter 1 and 11, don't turn there, but it says, 
it's talking about where we're going, and it says, and I'm quoting, it says that we're going to the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You need to get this kingdom business in your gizzard. Hallelujah. You need to understand what is going on in this world. And what is going on is that there's kingdoms rising and kingdoms declining. But there's an ultimate kingdom of Jesus Christ that is here before it came, before the rest of them came. It's here now, and yet it's not here in its fullness yet. And we're in the middle of this. I want to talk about that just a little bit more tonight. The kingdom of God. One of the things that Jesus told us to pray when we prayed, He didn't tell us to pray about much, but He said, when you pray, pray, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, hallelujah. Money is so unstable. Was anybody here that can remember what was going on in 1929 and 1930 when people were absolutely killing themselves because their money lost its value? And in Germany where they were taking a whole wheelbarrow load of money to buy a loaf of bread, I know you don't think that can happen again, but, brother, it could all go kaput tomorrow morning. Well, that makes everybody happy, doesn't it? I'm just telling you. Well, some of you don't matter because you just said, what's the difference? I don't have any anyway. Some of you that it matters, you know, you're saying, oh, God, I hope that don't happen. Well, I hope it don't happen, but if it does, I won't take something. You better realize then that you can shout because you're in a kingdom where the money doesn't lose its value. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. This kingdom that I'm talking about, I don't know why we don't hear more preaching about it, but the kingdom I'm talking about, the idea of the kingdom of God, that, that God is king and that he has a kingdom, is deeply rooted in the Old Testament. And I took time tonight to give you a little example of that. There are characteristics of this kingdom that are shown to us by the teachings of Jesus and primarily by the parables of Jesus that we would not know what the kingdom of God is like any other way. I want to know more about what the kingdom of God is like, don't you? I mean, I want to know. I'm, I mean, this is the kingdom that's going to be, so I want to know more about it. And uh, one of the things I want to tell you just before I even go any further is that that one of the things that I love about the kingdom of God <clears throat> is that constantly the kingdom of God, the consummation of the kingdom of God is constantly referred to as a kingdom that it, when it reaches its fruition, it's going to be like a permanent marriage feast. Or it's going to be like a permanent supper. Hallelujah. Everybody that's more than 20 pounds overweight said amen. Yeah. Every time you see Jesus talking about the kingdom and its consummation, you will see what Bible scholars call his, him referring to the, the messianic banquet. Jesus constantly talks in terms of there's going to be a time when the kingdom reaches its, its full introduction into the earth, that there's going to be a great celebration and it's going to be a great feast time. I don't want to uh, belabor the point tonight, but many of you will remember the times, numerous times in this church, that reference has been made to where Jesus did his first miracle at the, uh, at the marriage feast of Cana. And the fact of the matter is that it wasn't an accident that it was done at a marriage feast. And the fact of the matter is it was not an accident that it was done at a marriage feast where they had run out of wine, and wine represented the libation of celebration. Wine represented the joy juice. Wine represented that which brought festive feelings to the party. And the party was going on, but there was no joy juice. They had the party was there, but there was nothing to make you happy. The decorations don't look quite as bright without the joy juice as they do with the joy juice. Huh? And so, 
And it wasn't that old cheap Thunderbird stuff. It was the real. <laughs> oh, God. Save us, Jesus. Aren't you glad that God saved you? Aren't you winos glad God saved you? Bottom of the bottle winos. God saved you. You don't have to stand and identify yourselves, but aren't you glad for what Jesus did? And so, Jesus is portraying that life and the kingdom of God is like a great wedding party. And that it is supposed to be sustained over a period of time. But that man's usage of the kingdom of God had sustained the party through the forms of religion, but it had lost the joy that made it a party. And when there is no joy in the party, it ceases to be a party. Because the difference between work and partying is not how much you have to do. It's whether you're enjoying it or not. Amen. And so at this party, there is nothing to give it joy. Jesus is pointing out by His miracle that the joy of the Lord is what makes life have a party. And He is using a marriage supper right out of the gate of his ministry, he uses a marriage supper. And if I can jump to the very end of his ministry, when he is eating the last supper with his disciples, uh, he sits down with his disciples. Uh, and at that marriage supper, at that supper where he is uh, just before he's going to be crucified, he eats that supper. And this is what he said at that supper. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. He's saying to them, I'm eating with you the Last Supper, but the Last Supper is representative to you of the marriage supper. And that's what communion is supposed to be. People that's trivialized all of this. It is a reminder that there's coming a supper where there's going to be the new wine, the heavenly bread that we're going to live on and with. And there's going to be a redeeming time in which it's going to consummate with the marriage supper of the Lamb. Listen, we don't even read these Scriptures hardly, but Jesus said in I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. That ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones uh, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Right now, I don't care about sitting on the throne. I don't care about judging the twelve tribes of Israel. All I care about right now is the party part. Uh, I just want you to know when I get there, I'm going to drink with Him and I'm going to eat with Him. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. It's a permanent, a perpetual, an eternal guarantee uh, of the joy juice always being there. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Over and over in the stories and parables of Jesus, He's saying things like, And a man made a great supper. He wanted us to understand this is the character of the kingdom of God. It's not moving towards doom. The world's moving towards doom. The kingdoms of the world that I've already reviewed briefly for you in a thumbnail sketch are moving towards doom, but this kingdom is moving towards dinner. The name of this message for the next ten seconds is doom or dinner. I'm heading for dinner. How about you? Hallelujah. I got a mama on the other side that's got her mind back from Alzheimer's, I can hear right now singing, Come home, come home, it's supper time. Oh, hallelujah. The shadows lengthen fast. Come home, come home, it's supper time. We're going home at last. Hallelujah. That's where we're heading. That's what the kingdom of God's about. Y'all are in these shabby little ragged, shaggy looking kingdoms down here and you're putting everything you've got in it. My God, you need to get a revelation and get in the kingdom of God and put your eggs in the basket that doesn't have holes in the bottom of it. Amen. 
Hey, and just a little word of encouragement to you that's been bad boys and girls. When the prodigal came home, the operative phrase is, come home. When the prodigal came home, the father said, kill the fatted calf. We are fixing to celebrate. When the guy lost his sheep and it was found, he called his neighbors and said, rejoice with me. When the lady lost her coin under the bed and finally swept the house and found it, she said, come and rejoice with me. Everything about the kingdom has to do with the culmination and consummation of rejoicing. Don't sell it out for some two-bit kingdom that's already predicted to be smashed. Amen. There are four things about the kingdom in the present. Now, the kingdom of God has an eternal feature that's always been there. In His sovereignty, He rules everything. And then there's the kingdom of God as we know it in the present, which I want to spend a little bit of time on. And then the kingdom of God in the future. I've read you scriptures about that already tonight. But the kingdom of God in the present, you have to understand some things about it, or you will get thrown into uh, confusion because you don't understand the kingdom of God in the present. And these four things that characterize the kingdom of God in the present, one is is that it's got an otherworldly kind of way to get into it. The kingdom of God in the present. You can get into other kingdoms. You can get into America by entering, passing the lady in New York City or wherever, and coming in through immigration. You can get in through going through a process of making sure you don't have any terminal diseases, making sure that all the other factors that are important are taken care of. But to get into this kingdom, there's an otherworldly process. The kingdom of God, to my knowledge, is only mentioned once in the book of John, and it's in chapter 3, verse 3 and verse 5, where he says uh, that to get into the kingdom of God, you cannot see the kingdom of God except the man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again, really, in the Greek, means born from above. Except he be born from above. Born from what above? Born from a kingdom that is above. Born into what? Born into a kingdom that's from above. Uh, a, a heavenly birth for a heavenly kingdom. They got a match. You got an earthly birth for an earthly kingdom. But you got to have a heavenly birth for a heavenly kingdom. It's not the doctrine that the Masons and others teach that of the of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, meaning that God's the father of everybody by the fact they're born into this world. It's not a true doctrine. When you're born into this world, you're not born in as a child of God. You're born as, as one that is disenfranchised from the blessings of God. You've got to be born again. You've got to be born from above. You've got to receive the Holy Ghost. You've got to repent of your sins. You've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. You've got to obey the Word of God. You've got to obey the Gospel. He said a man cannot. Everybody said cannot. You cannot. That doesn't mean maybe. That doesn't mean almost can. That doesn't mean you might sneak by. A man cannot enter the kingdom of God except, or he can't even see it, except he be born again. He must. Everybody said must. He must be born again of the water and the Spirit. There's no use me trying to change that and becoming a liar in the process. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, you've got to be born again. I don't care if you're the mayor or the, or the butler or the butcher or the baker or the candlestick maker. I don't care if you're the professor. I don't care if you're the president. I don't care who you are. You have to repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and live a holy life and bear fruit. Oh, hallelujah. That's the only way to get into this kingdom. Let's clap our hands again and thank God that we're in the kingdom that abides forever. It's easy to miss the kingdom of God. Because Romans 14, 17 says the kingdom of God is not meat nor drink. Luke 20 and 20 says the kingdom of God cometh not by observation. You can't put it in a test tube. Mix stuff up and test it and see if it's truly the kingdom of God. You can't sip it. Is that the new wine? No, you can't tell that way.
drink with it. You can't tell that way. It cometh not by observation. It comes not by scientific inquiry. It comes by, it comes by, he said the next verse, the kingdom of God comes within you. It comes by spiritual processes, not by earthly process. Second thing about the kingdom of God in the present is that it is characterized by hiddenness. It is characterized by hiddenness. It is hidden. It's not overt. It's covert, not overt. It's secret. One place Jesus was talking about prayer and He said, when you pray, pray in your closet in secret. And your Father, which is in secret. Another Scripture says, Thou art a God which hidest Thyself. That's what the Pharisees constantly dealt with with Jesus. Why don't you just come on out and tell us who you are? That there was constantly a veil, a little haziness, a little abstraction tied to it. Because when you get, when you get in things of an eternal nature, what you think is concrete, like show it to me, like this rag, show it to me, that's not really concrete when you get in this world. You have to go to another level of concreteness. And that's not a level of concreteness. That's a level of nothingness. Made a lot of sense, didn't it? And to get in that world where there's this kind of concreteness, there, there's the idea of hiddenness. It seems the chapter in the Bible that describes most repeatedly in one setting the kingdom of God is Matthew chapter 13. And in it there are seven parables that Jesus gave. And in all seven of those parables... The characteristic that is most common of all seven is that something is hidden. The sower sows the seed and it's hidden in the earth. The wheat is hidden in the earth. The tares are hidden in the earth. The mustard seed is hidden in the earth. The leaven is hidden in the meal. The treasure is hidden in the field. The pearl is hidden in the whatever makes pearls. The fish are hidden under the water. On and on and on. It's a hidden characteristic. That's why people who do not have a right degree of hunger and thirst never find the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus said, Blessed is he that hungereth and thirst after righteousness. That's why Jesus said, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Because there has to be something in you that finally comes to the conclusion, Are you hearing me tonight? There has to be something finally come to you that says, I want it, I want it, I want it. I want it bad enough to lay down what my relatives think. I want it bad enough to lay down what my employer thinks. I I want it bad enough to risk my future. I want it bad enough to risk my past. I want it bad enough to gamble on my present. I want it bad enough. Whatever it takes, I want it that bad. Because until you get there, it remains hidden behind a veil and you never see it. And you can become so cocky and so arrogant in your human intellectual stupidity and dimness and ignorance and think, and man rocks around like a peacock thinking he knows everything and he knows nothing because he is a man that's walking in darkness and he doesn't see the hidden kingdom of God right in front of his face. That's why I want to humble myself before the mighty hand of God. And it has been hidden from the wise and the prudent. There it is again. But revealed in the babes. Don't let the hidden characteristic of the kingdom of God throw you for a loop. You can wake up in the morning and you can say, I don't see the kingdom of God. All I see is my pickup truck and work. Where's the kingdom of God? All I see is I got a runny nose and my kids got runny noses. And that stuff didn't work and screen doors ripped off and bing bongs are coming off my slippers and everything's bad. Nothing matters. Kingdom of God. I don't see no kingdom of God. That's a bunch of baloney. Kingdom of God. But what happens is, is that you degenerate down to a real low level of life where you only are conscious of these visible deceptions. 
To see the kingdom of God, you have to lift your eyes. To see the kingdom of God, you have to activate that mind of yours that says there's a lot of things that I cannot see that are real. To, to, to see the kingdom of God, you have to go out there far enough until everything in your life is not just something that can be held in your hand. Everybody said the kingdom of God is hidden. And yet it's revealed to those that get in the Spirit. Aren't you glad you've gotten the Spirit? Another third characteristic is that the kingdom of God is characterized <clears throat> according to the parables of Jesus. And this doesn't square with some people's eschatology, but it's there nevertheless. A lot of people say, man, I, my father used to say, you believe Jesus is coming? I say, yeah. You believe he's coming soon? I said, yeah. He said, well, I've heard that all my life. What's the deal? Now, he had the Holy Ghost and loved God. I said, well, do you believe he's coming? He said, well, yeah, I believe he's coming. I said, well, what are you asking me for? Well, I just want you to explain to me why I hadn't come yet. But he said, I've heard prophecies, tongues, interpretation that he's coming all my life. And he's, before he was ever born, I heard people talking about he's coming, people selling everything they had and going up on top of a mountain in Los Angeles. And, and he said, all this was going on. He hadn't come yet. Well, my answer to him was, well, you believe he's coming? Yeah, I believe he's coming. Okay, well, there's your answer. But I will tell you that there are parables which indicate that the long period of time was always anticipated by the Lord. And in a section of 23 verses, in Matthew 24 and 25, he gives at least four clues to us that the kingdom of God had a long delay gap between its institution and its culmination. And those four are found in 2448 where the man was left in charge and he didn't do his job. He acted irresponsibly. The Lord of the farm said, take care of this while I'm gone and I'm leaving. And while he's gone, the guy that was in charge of taking care of it said, my Lord delayeth his coming. And so he began to beat the servants. He began to act irresponsibly. He, he quit trying to make growth come to the kingdom. Are you hearing me tonight? Now I want to tell you, you get enough of these 15-minute sermons from these hotshot evangelists that's memorized them and just quotes them all over the country. You need to learn to sit down and just listen and just keep on listening. Pretty soon, pretty soon, if everything you eat isn't put in a cardboard box with pretty colors that you can pop in the microwave in 30 seconds, you ain't eating it. Oh, hallelujah. My Lord delayeth his coming, he said. The second place that let us know there was a delay was 25 and 5, where he said, that between the time that the call went that the bridegroom's coming and the time that he came, it said they all slumbered and slept, which indicates a long period of time that they finally got tired. They got tired. How many preachers and saints do I hear when they get a little bit older? I'm just, brother, was it? I'm just tired of holding the standard. I'm just tired. Good to have you home, brother and sister Brister. I'm just tired of having to preach it when it seems like people are pressing against you and the world's so bad, brother. I'm just tired. I just can't do it anymore. Oh, bottom on. Oh, hallelujah. Matthew 25 and 14. He said, The owner... Another parable, similar to these others, said the owner went to a far. Everybody said far. That's not something burning. Went to a far country. Far country. Must have been a hot place. Went to a far country. A distant country. For all of you deep southerners. A distant country. The implication is, is that it's going to take time to get there and time to get back. And he said, while I'm gone, I'm leaving you in charge. The Lord may come tomorrow and 
He may not come tomorrow. Don't be making bets with God. Bets and bargains don't work. God, I'm going to live for you five more minutes, and if you don't come, I'm smoking a camel. Well, honey, don't even wait five minutes. Just light up. Because it ain't going to happen that way. You're going to have to make up your mind. I don't care if you don't come in five minutes or 50 years. I've got my mind made up. I'm going to be in this kingdom. It don't matter how long it takes. I'm going through. You went to a far country. I don't know how long it'll be till you get back. But when you get back, I'm going to be tending shop just like you told me to. And 25.19 says, And after a long time, everybody said long time, you did it right. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh. Millennium 2000. Rosen, why are you planning on building that building? The Lord's coming. Well, I believe He's coming too. In fact, I believe that 2000 is more likely to come in than any time since He was here before. I mean that. You that's fiddling around on the edges, and I want to tell you, we don't know. We know that the calendar is not exactly right. We know it's four or five years off. In fact, you better get up out of that chair and run and hit this altar right now and cry your way through to the Holy Ghost, because He may come before I get through. I'm telling you, it's truth. Well, what are you going to do if He don't? Keep calling the county. What are you going to do if you don't? Keep plowing up. What are you going to do if you don't? Keep making plans. Keep growing. Keep winning souls. Keep reorganizing. Making the tent bigger. Stretching the stakes. Amen. Expanding everything. Building bigger barns for His kingdom and not our kingdom. What if He comes in the middle of that? Hang it. But if He don't come, we're going to be working. Don't get irresponsible in the last minute and run up to the mountains with your bunker and your generator. We preach against having TVs. If you get the cussing in them generators, we're going to preach against having a generator in your home. I'm telling you, people selling stuff and moving. I know some people selling stuff in Houston and moving to North Carolina because for some reason it's supposed to be safer. I'll tell you, it'd take a bad day in Houston to make me move to North Carolina. Excuse me. to be a missionary to want to go to North Carolina. Anyway. Until it comes. It, it may be a long time. Brother Wilson, what if there gets to be more bureaucracy? What if there gets to be more laws? What if there gets to be more constraints? What if there gets to be such a jungle of stuff you've got to go through? What, what, if, what if... I don't care. We'll just keep going through the jungle. Somebody says, don't you ever get frustrated? I used to. I don't get much frustrated about it anymore. Just call them again. Just go through it one more time. Brother Wilson, how long are you going to raise money? Do you know how much it costs to build this next monstrosity? We're going to raise money as long as we got to raise money. Well, I don't got it. Then you can't give it. What are you worried about? It's us that's got it that's going to give it. You got it, Brother Wilson? Sure, I got it. Where'd you get it? I got it by giving. You said, I don't believe that. That's why you ain't got any. 
You need to get the revelation of how this kingdom operates. It doesn't operate like the Gentile dominions operate. It's a long-term engagement. And therefore, we that's got the revelation of the kingdom of God have a long-term commitment to the kingdom of God. And last, everybody breathed a sigh of relief when he said, and last. This is a smart aleck church. If anybody's saying, just like their leader, I'll say it wasn't that way before Brother Young and Brother Bowman and Brother Sergeant got here. Back in those days, we were all just humble and innocent. The last thing is that the kingdom of God in the present, and the parables of Jesus make this very, very clear. The parables of Jesus make it very clear that there's an otherworldly entrance. The, king, the parables of Jesus make it very clear that it is characterized by hiddenness. That's why everybody's not in it. The parables of Jesus make it very clear that it may turn out to be a long-term engagement. Therefore, you don't start getting sloppy, gambling that He will come before everything falls apart in your life but you maintain it right close up against the collar at all times to make sure that your preparedness is such that when He comes, He says, Well done, thou good and faithful rock church. And last of all, the kingdom in the present day, the parables reiterate this at least four or five times over is that the kingdom is characterized by growth. Jesus said that. Jesus taught that. A sower went forth to sow. There was growth. There's a harvest. And then he, after that parable, he gives one about another guy that sows, although it's the same, it's the story of spreading the gospel, about the one that sows the wheat there's growth. And another sows tares. There's two kingdoms working in hiddenness. He sows them at night. There's a growth of the world's kingdom at the same time that there's a growth of God's kingdom. And they're growing together. Don't be surprised by that. They're growing together. And there's aspects of it that you can't tell apart. Is this for the kingdom's growth? Is this computer for the kingdom's growth? Or is this for the world's growth? The wheat and the tares looks the same for a while. If you give it enough time, it'll shake, it'll shake out which is wheat and which is tares. That's just one example of how, how for a while it's, it all looks too muddled to tell the difference. And you try to tear up one and you tear up the good when you tear up the bad and on and on. But it's characterized by growth. The, the mustard seed, the kingdom is characterized by growth. The mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds, when it's planted, it didn't just grow up into a plant, but it grew up into a plant big enough for the fowls of the air. In the Bible, the fowls of the air represent oftentimes the Gentile nations, the Gentile nations resting in the branches. Growth. There's other interpretations to that, but that's one of them. The leaven in the bread. There's other interpretations of this too, but, but it represents growth. Whatever else it represents, it represents growth of the loaf. There's a growth process. And so the kingdom grows. How far can the kingdom grow with a people that have a revelation about the characteristic of its hiddenness. Who understand that it has an otherworldly characteristic for entrance and sustenance. Who understand that it is a long-term engagement 
and therefore it's not a flight of fancy or an emotional high, and then it's flicked off and gone again. And you've got to reignite the emotional high. But there's something that says, no, this is part of the commitment to the only kingdom that is going to last forever. And now we're going to take an offering. Ushers, bring the offering. How committed am I to the kingdom of God? How committed I am to a long-term engagement with the kingdom of God? Let's just set them up here. Set them on the altar. How committed am I to a long-term engagement? How committed am I? A couple over there. Yeah. You guys figure out how to do that. How committed am I? How much does this mean to me? I need men and women tonight to understand the call of the kingdom. Let's move that plate over this way a little bit. About right there. The call of the kingdom that come and say, Brother Wilson, I'm committed to the call of the kingdom. And I made a commitment, and I'm glad that on the first of the month it's my chance to bring my commitment one more time. I want to see the kingdom of God overflow with impaction on this world. And I understand the long-term consequences and implications of being faithful. All right. Let's just come. Who wants to be a model tonight of faithfulness and say, I'm just bringing my offering to the Lord and I'm giving it to Him. I'm just doing it because I know that I'm committed to the cause. And my commitment makes me faithful. And I'm doing it in Jesus' name because I'm committed to the cause. Here I am. I see its long-term implications. I see that the world's not going to do it because they can't see it. It's hidden from them. I see that this is the night that we do this as we approach Millennium 2000. And I'm doing it with faith in my heart. Faith in my soul. Faith in God. Maybe God's talked to somebody tonight. You're not just making the commitment you made. You're going to double it. Mr. Brother Wilson, aren't you embarrassed doing this? Not even remotely. Because, you see, I'm not cynical about the kingdom. I believe. I believe what I'm preaching. I believe in the kingdom of God. I believe in its eternal import. Amen. How about you tonight? How about you? Maybe you're just saying, Brother Wilson, I want to do something extra tonight. I just want to do something extra tonight. I'm going to give everything to you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I'm committed to your kingdom. Maybe you've already given, but you said I didn't give enough. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Oh, Christ we love. Christ we love. Christ we love. Oh, Christ we love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Come on. 
church in West Sacramento in a U-Haul that they drove 2,000 miles in 105, 106, 107 degree heat. That's where we started. I remember Brother Fitzpatrick, just a single, really, kid, committed to the cause singing, playing, leading when there wasn't but 12, 15, 20 of us. I remember Brother Bob and Sister Joanne and their kids <coughs> living in a motorhome beside the church had a wire strung between the church and the motorhome with their Wash hung on the wire. I don't know if it's underwear, but it was wash. I remember Brother Sister Pope not having a house. He lived in our house for five or six weeks like a bunch of gypsies. It's true. I remember Sister Susan typing. Our office was my garage. My garage was about 110 degrees. I remember typing and walking out while she was typing and sweat running off of her. She didn't have to join a hell spa, just type in the garage. hour after hour. I'm talking about long term commitment. I remember when Brother Newton didn't have any money and I gave him ingenious ways to make money, selling oranges and stuff. Brother Mabry thought he was never going to get him out of his house. Hallelujah. Long term commitment. Long term commitment. I remember when the Woggies came. Long time ago. <clears throat> Shouldn't have started naming names because I can't remember all the names. People that said we're going to go the distance. And then others were added on. But Tim King. Where you at, but Tim? Are you here tonight? But Tim King. He's sick. When brother, when brother Tim King came into the church, he had a job as a motel maid, making up beds for a motel, him and Blake Adams. That's right. Then on down the line, others came in got the Holy Ghost, became faithful, walking with God. Somewhere back there, Brother Sister Scott came. That was a rough and tumble world. Didn't know if them Scott kids would ever amount to hill of beans. I was told they wouldn't. That they'll never amount to anything. Well, it ain't over yet. 
but they're making it. Hallelujah. So, well, Brother Wilson, how do you put up with all this? Well, how do you put up with it? You have to put up with what I'm doing right now. We all just put up with one another. We just put up and shut up and go on. Keep walking. Brother and Sister Jones, I don't know. Some of you, when you got the Holy Ghost, it was a, you were a long ways from God, but you become powerful people until the body continues to grow, continues to expand, continues to become. Amen. So here we are tonight. There may be $4 million in this offering. I doubt it. You say, well, do you have faith? Not that much. Am I supposed to lie? No, I don't believe it's $4 million here. If you tell me you do, I'll tell you you're goofy. I mean, there may be. But Brother Fitzpatrick said it right behind me just then. He said, there will be. And that's true. There will be. If God cares, we'll take up $4 million offers. We'll do that sometimes just to give it all away. So we're going to give this away to the missionaries. We're going to give this away. You say, well, is that really going to happen? Oh, yeah, it's really going to happen. That is no more preposterous than it was even 10 years ago, thinking in April we'd get $70,000 above tithe and offering. It was, that was as preposterous. That was more preposterous than saying $4 million. 